Many JavaScript developers are already familiar with at least the basics of HTML, but just in case not, we included two sessions on a crash course on HTML. Similarly, many JavaScript developers already know at least the basics of CSS. If you're one of those, you don't have to go through this section. Skip it entirely, move on to jQuery. However, if you're brand new to web development, then CSS is an important skill to know. Now, this section will not cover the advanced CSS, it will not cover all of CSS, but it'll introduce you to the basics. And since jQuery, at least partially, is based on CSS, it's important to know at least the basics of CSS before you leave core JavaScript syntax and move on to jQuery syntax. Now, this is a fast introduction. If you want a more thorough introduction, just Google CSS tutorials and you'll get a lot more detail, but it'll also take a lot more time. So if you are new to CSS and you want a real fast intro, continue on. Okay, so a style sheet is a file that contains descriptions on how things in the page ought to be laid out. That's a style sheet. And how do you load one? Well, you use the link tag. And the link tag points at your style sheet. Now, typically, it's not required, but typically your style sheet is in a subfolder under the location where your HTML file is. And in XHTML, it was required that you supplied the type attribute. This is optional in HTML5. I will normally leave it off. So the style sheet doesn't have to go in a subfolder, and that subfolder doesn't have to be called CSS. But a typical good design is to put your main HTML in one folder, put your images in another folder, put your JavaScript files in a third folder, and put your CSS files in a fourth folder. All right, so the most common strategy is you make a CSS file, and then you attach it to more than one web page. So that way, if you decide, well, my web design says that I ought to have a little bit of a lighter background, you change the CSS files, and all of your pages change automatically. Or if you want a little bit bigger font, you change the fonts in your CSS file, and all of the pages change automatically. So the most reusable and general purpose strategy is you have a CSS file because it can apply to multiple pages. But sometimes you have a style tag. You might have some styles that apply to this page only. You don't want to make a separate CSS file. It's a little too much work. You don't want to clutter up the main CSS file because it applies to multiple pages. So you can use a style tag. We'll cover this syntax shortly, but the idea is that the things that you put inside a style tag are the same kinds of things that you could put inside a CSS file. But a CSS file can apply to multiple HTML pages, while a style tag applies to only a single page. And while a style tag applies to a single page, an inline style applies only to a single tag within the page. So a CSS file is most general purpose. A style tag is the second most general purpose. A inline style is the most specific. But sometimes you have a one-off. Oh, this line right here, I want to add a little extra space above and below. This is not something I'm going to repeat anyway. You can do an inline style. And in particular, sometimes JavaScript dynamically, after the fact, manipulates the inline style. That's probably even more common than putting the inline style indirectly. So what we did on the previous slide, a style sheet file that's attached to the page is the most general purpose. That's what you're going to do 90% of the time. But be aware that you can have a style tag or an inline style as well. All right, we will go through this idea of selectors, what the CSS applies to in the next section. But let's just summarize briefly. The two most general categories are that CSS styles can apply to general elements of a certain type or specific elements that you have to designate. If they apply to general elements, then they apply automatically. And so here's an example. In my style sheet file, I might say h2. h2 is an HTML element. So the styles that I describe in curly braces here automatically apply to all h2 elements in the page. When I write HTML, I don't have to say, oh, this is something that's styled in some sort of specific way. Automatically, they're picked up. So in my HTML file, assuming that I load that style sheet, if I use the h2 tag, then automatically, the foreground color comes out blue, and the font comes out in a non-serifed font. More commonly, 
you apply styles to specific elements. In your CSS file, you start the style with a dot. So I don't would not have done that with h2. I wouldn't have said dot h2. Here I would say dot warning. Warning is a name that I made up. It's not an existing HTML element. It's just a name that I made up. When I make up the name, then in my HTML I have to apply the name, and I apply the name using class. So when I say class equals warning, no, notice that there's no dot here. There's a dot when you write it in the CSS file to distinguish it from an HTML element. But when you use the class attribute, you don't give a dot. You don't say class equals dot warning. You just say class equals warning. This is much more common. This way you don't accidentally style things in the page that you didn't intend. And so the HTML author needs to say, oh, I want to apply this style to this particular span or this particular P or this particular H1 or this particular table or this particular row and so forth. Once you've defined classes, things that begin with dots, you're even allowed to have more than one. So if I separate them by spaces, all of the styles apply. But then you have to ask yourself the question, well, what if two of the styles designate the same thing? They both give the foreground color. And then the general rule is the second one overrides the first one.